warm welcome to all of you. I presume um, everybody is uh, healthy and happy and safe. So uh, this webinar is about automated QA transformation with highest level of uh, uh, business assurance. That's the title we're going to um, talk on. Few uh, pointers in terms of um, how we can uh, achieve uh, a good QA transformation, which will lead you to a highest business assurance. So uh, well, I presume all of you can see the slides. Um, with that uh, note, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Okay, a uh, little bit of about me. So my name is Tikan Manohar, uh, shortly called as Malo, um, and I work for a company called Indium Software. I have the digital assurance for India. Indium is into quality assurance, uh, digital and gaming uh, industry. So we've been in the industry for almost 20 years, so I'm proud to be representing this company. So from my experience and close to uh, 25, 23 years of the industry, I've seen the length and breadth of the industry. Uh, my strengths, uh, of course, quality engineering, and I, I did a little bit of PCM and uh, business process management as well. Innovator by choice, um, uh, I strongly believe you always have a better solution than the one uh, you're currently thinking. I started as a developer, so I have a very strong hold uh, in programming languages. Uh, and I'm basically a people mentor because uh, I read a lot of uh, psychology uh, and psychology related books uh, uh, on my free time. So without rambling more into about myself, I'll quickly jump on to the agenda that we had. So uh, today we're going to be doing a little bit of time travel, um, talking on what this industry uh, and how this industry has transformed uh, since the late 90s uh, to what we have currently. So uh, there's a reason why I'm going to talk on that, which I will mention about it while I uh, run through that portion of it. We will then uh, quickly see what are the typical bottlenecks uh, any quality assurance uh, team go through um, in today's context. And uh, there is always uh, a haze uh, between uh, what people call it library, framework, tools, and platform. There's various definitions um, in in Google and various forums. I want to kind of clarify that. Um, and then what is the need of the hour? Why do we need a smart platform? And then, of course, uh, I'm going to talk on what Indium has done um, to overcome some of these challenges, uh, which I'll be talking on. And of course, I leave the floor for uh, question and answer. So that's the fact agenda, I think. The webinar uh, uh, runs about 30, 30 minutes or so, and then um, we'll, we'll take up uh, questions. So uh, just some bookkeeping exercises. So all of your uh, uh, sessions are in mute. Um, um, that means you won't be able to speak. So I can only talk. And the chat window is open, so you can definitely uh, fly in your questions. Uh, there are moderators in the background. They will get those questions. If I'm able to answer some of these questions, um, uh, you are lucky. If not, we will send out uh, an email with uh, some uh, materials and your questions answered. Um, so that's how we have decided to take it on. So without further delay, I will move on to the next slide. Okay, so as I said, uh, in this slide, I want to talk about uh, industry perspective. When I say industry perspective, I started my career way back in '97, and um, during my college days, um, you know, I'm I was associated in, uh, with the IT space. So I want to share some of that experience, how the industry, how the IT industry has changed and transformed itself. Uh, you'll be surprised to hear some of these pointers that I'm going to talk about. So I have about ten points, but of course, this is not limited. Some of the old timers may have other, uh, you know, industry transformations. So, um, I'll go one by one. The first one, the web itself, if you look at it, uh, you know, web 1.0, this is actually the web 0.0, uh, you know, what came to be called as uh, internet. 1.0, uh, as experts call uh, the internet before 99, it, it's probably a read only uh, web. Uh, average internet user's role was limited to reading the information which was presented uh, to him. 
the best examples of this 1.0 era is probably the static websites uh, during the dot com boom we we collect or some of your fathers and mothers would be collected that you put it that way and uh, web 2.0 what uh, we call it social um, the reason being because of lack of interaction with the common users in web 1.0 uh, it led to the birth of web 2.0 so obviously it means uh, there were interactions um, from the user's perspective For example uh, uh, you might be knowing obviously youtubes the facebooks the bloggers the live journals um, so predominantly web 2.0 to the credit it, it was driven by users and their content okay. and, and still we we still live in the era of youtube but uh, the web has transformed beyond the 2.0 uh, uh, if you look at 3.0 uh, we call it the semantic world where the internet is actually driven by connected services uh, like the iots the connected cars uh, in fact at some point you will forget uh, the web being the browser based than web is omnipresent for example when cars talk to each other there is absolutely no browsers right uh, and similarly if you go to web 4.0 uh, it is actually the intelligent form of web where the content is actually personalized based on what you read Uh, or based on what you search, or what you, where you travel, or what you spend, uh, you might have seen this uh, in in your mobile phone apps. Many of the phone apps nowadays uh, live in the web 4.0 world, where uh, where you travel, what you do uh, reflects in in your uh, mobile apps. So those are the intelligence web 4.0. Web 5.0 is more of symbiotic, where uh, it is still under development. they are planning to get the emotional quotient into the interaction between humans and computers i mean that's a long way to go but that is driven by the users habit uh, and and what you will see is basically the emotional outcome of uh, you know uh, how you feel on that particular day uh, driven by a lot of uh, neurotechnology space uh, you know there will be a feeling there will be emotions uh, so on and so forth uh, so now that's about web and now Uh, if you look at the next, uh, uh, you know, industry transformation is on the HTML per se, uh, hypertext markup language, which is the backbone of uh, the very web page. You know, it all started in 1993 as 1.0 version. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee actually created this markup language. It was HTML, and then he created the HTML from it. So what uh, started as 1.0 moved to 2.0 back in 1995, where form based submissions were introduced tables were introduced and some uh, internet internationalization principles were introduced so the browser was able to uh, display content in multiple languages then came the 4.0 uh, in 1997 range and then uh, back then it was ieef uh, which was owning this html and then w3c was uh, the uh, consortium uh, which was which, which undertook this html uh, from that time onwards um, you might remember the netscape browsers uh, people who used to work in 97 uh, like me uh, we, we we were using netscape those times uh, ie was very very new so during that time from the frame sets uh, and the other principles of frames multiple frame sets were introduced in photos and of course photos zero ruled the world uh, big time and very recently as you might have heard in 2008 uh, 5.0 was introduced uh, brand new elements like canvas video audio new form controls a lot of things were uh, uh, actually uh, you know uh, brought in etc now uh, the next aspect is the internet side of things i mean the network side of things as you all know tcp ip the ip side of things is internet protocol uh we we were living in the ip4 uh, era for a long long time uh, since its existence from 1980 i would say uh, the limitation of uh, the ip4 was just 4.3 billion ip addresses uh, soon we actually ran out of those ip addresses and then ip uh, version 6 was brought in which uh, gave us an ability to have ip addresses that are 128 bit uh, addresses which would mean uh, i can generate up to 7.9 into 10 power 28 uh, set of ip addresses so it's a long way to go uh, because now we have more and more devices as we speak not only your laptops or computers we have mobile devices now we have iot devices everything has uh, ip address so um, this is one other major transition that the world has seen 
the next one is internal speed. This is pretty obvious. Um, I used to, I, I still remember those days where the modem used to make a lot of funny sounds uh, when it was running in uh, 512 KPPS. So we, we have to have a dial up and the dial up will connect to the internet and then the max you would get a speed of 512 KPPS. Then 2G came in, 3G, 4G. Now we are talking about 5G as well. Uh, that's the network speed transition. Again, same goes with wired and Wi Fi. Uh, uh, you know, we, we now have 1 Gbps speed, uh, which means a lot of uh, internet capacity is available uh, to the applications that, uh, that are being developed. Uh, from a development methodology, as you know, from the waterfall based model where the requirements has to be completed, development has to be completed, and the testing always gets the last uh, buy of uh, the pizza. Uh, now things have changed. It is more and more agile, um, sprint-based, and you have to test very often. Uh, that that's a big shift uh, that was brought in this agile uh, model. Of course, it has multiple flavors, but uh, the methodology has completely changed. And from architecture, um, this is uh, very important. Where we used to have three-tier architecture in those days, it was called monolithic, where a typical a client, there'll be a business component, there'll be a database component. So that was the typical architecture in every walk of application uh, you would consider. And then there was a era of uh, service oriented architecture where uh, most of the business uh, side was treated as uh, services. And now uh, we live in the era of microservices where every service can be written in its own language, it has its own uh, you know, environment to run. Uh, you can have uh, IP address for each of the servers. Each service can talk to each other. Each service can be remote. It can live in its own network. And more and more dockers, containers, whatnot. So the technology has really transformed in, in the architecture space as well. Now, uh, data centers, the cloud, obviously, this is a very well known fact. Gone all those days of on prem servers uh, where an expert team. The data center team maintains it, but now everything is cloud. Nowadays, we are talking about hybrid cloud as well that is catching up multi tenancy, whatnot. So, that is another transformation. Uh, this is very interesting. Now, um, this could be a COVID effect as well, where the brick and mortar shopping experience is slowly fading away. Now, people are turning towards uh, online channel. More so, they call it om omni channel experience. Uh, what it means is the experience I see in one one platform is same as uh, and I go to a different platform. What it means is, let's say today I, I use my browser to do my e-commerce shopping. Tomorrow I uh, uh, have my mobile, I will have a similar experience. So that is what, or tomorrow I use my iPad, uh, so I will have a same experience. Um, last but not least, uh, uh, you know, from a development cycle standpoint, there was a principle called RAD, uh, Rapid Application Development. Now, the recent era, it is now called low code. Uh, we are moving towards a low code solution. What it means is there are platforms like uh, Mendix and Claris, which offers this low code uh, solution, which means the application is developed as just a drag and drop and then deployed to a cloud. So the, um, the development time is drastically reduced and the focus is more on uh, what you need to build rather than how you need to build. Uh, and slowly the industry is moving towards a no-code uh, direction as well. So um, if you look at all of these uh, transactions, uh, you would wonder how the industry has transformed. But the uh, quality assurance side of things has taken very minimal transformation. If you cross your heart and look at it, we still do testing manually. Most of the companies I have attracted my customers, they still do uh, manual testing. Very uh, flaky automation. Sometimes, uh, you know, there are a lot of quality challenge uh, challenges. So uh, quality assurance has always taken a backseat. Um, and that is what we're going to be looking at in this uh, presentation. What are the ways and means to improve it uh, and to achieve this is, uh, assurance? Okay. Uh, hope this slide uh, had some information that was close to your heart. Moving on to the next slide. So in this slide, I want to uh, give you a perspective of what are the typical um, QA bottlenecks that any organization uh, are going through. Okay, so the first one being QA to QA. Now, you, some of you might know what QA is, but I'll go ahead and explain. Uh, since the methodology uh, 
there was a shift in the methodology from a waterfall based model to agile based model the demand uh, from a defect prevention has changed to a defect detection what it means is uh, nowadays people don't wait for uh, you know defect detection uh, uh, for example kiwi always take the uh, take the last cycle where people write test cases scenarios they they, they run through those test cases test cases execute them by means of manual or automation they detect defects so that is late to the game because agile demands defects to be prevented not detected so uh, that also we need to embrace cdci uh, principle which will mean more and more automation should be brought into space so the traditional quality assurance methodology um, is slowly wading away what people now call it is quality engineering which means the the quality assurance people should be plugged in to the engineering team where they do code review they do uh, defect prevention by uh, reviewing the code uh, executing more and more uh, smaller uh, chunks of unit tests um, and when they have to speak the jargon of uh, development people rather than talking only on manual test cases uh, boundary conditions those are still applicable but uh, the shift left has taken uh, a front seat um, qv in some industry is called s debt as well probably you might have heard it is uh, software development engineering testing all this uh, flavors come into one role so that is that is uh, most of most of the you know bottlenecks you see people are struggling to move from a qv to qv that is one challenge the second one uh, if you look at any customer there will be very minimal uh, you know uh, team that does everything for example either um, you know customers may have function testers very good function testers but they would lack in automation and hence their entire qa cycle would be slowed down um, they will have good automation and for you know function testers but they may uh, may not have the niche uh, testing skills like uh, performance testing or security testing so in that way what happens is uh, they will miss out these uh, say pt and st in every cycle so what eventually will happen this application goes and fails uh, non functionally at customer side so that is one other uh, important pain point that uh, typically every customer is going through um, the third one is diverse pool this is a challenge to any company for example for me to do automation i need probably a selenium skill um, on a, on a job of flavor for doing performance testing i need to have uh, x tool say jmeter or lodata for doing vulnerability assessment i need to have app scan etc so if you look at the diversity of the tools that we have to use to do carry out um, each of these testing it is very very diverse uh so that is definitely a challenge uh, which you not find it in uh, the team uh that will slow down the qa itself now disparate uh, expertise for example i may have a uh, tool knowledge but the expertise level in each of these tool will be very very different for example uh, i will have a person who will be very good in automation uh but very very basic in performance you know, or even in automation itself i will have somebody with a two year experience and i will have somebody with a five year experience now uh, the two year experience and five year experience cannot be coped up in the same team to do the same task because the five week five year would be doing uh, things better because he has uh, the experience so there there is always a disparity in the skill set as well now uh, imbalanced knowledge uh, that is again goes in in hand with the disparate expertise uh, this is the knowledge gap uh, for example uh, let's say uh, uh, from a best practice standpoint the five year experience would be able to write the code in a more structured way whereas the two year experience will still be able to get the outcome for you but a lot of best practice uh, would be missed and then debugging itself will be a huge uh, uh, you know task to uh, fulfill now this is again the impact of Uh, the waterfall to agile transition where the qa cycle is always uh, shortened um, you know sometimes uh, the sprint will run for two weeks and then development will consume one of weeks for your um, qa and then uh, uh, sorry uh, development the qa will get probably about uh, three or four days and they'll be ru- rushing up things so this is this is a major uh, drawback in some of these agile uh, models 
and the technology landscape. I think this is what we saw in the first slide. Uh, the technology is changing even more faster than the previous years. Now, uh, every morning you wake up, you need to uh, upgrade yourself. That is that is the way it is now. Previously, it was just at least once in six months you see some new thing coming up, but nowadays everything is changing very very drastically. Um, again, the DevOps and DevSecOps have evolved uh, like a monster, where uh, the expectation from the industry is uh, everything should be a DevOps-driven um, activity, which also includes performance testing and security testing. The industry is now struggling to do DevOps uh, with automation, so but the expectations a lot have gone beyond automation of PT and ST uh, as well as expected uh, to be in the DevOps uh, cycle. Now, with that said, the traditional way of doing function testing it is still a long uh, cycle um, because there will be a lot of defect uh, retesting that is required. So every time that defect has to be retested, the function team spends time manually. Though you put 20 member, 30 member team, one, the cost goes up, second, the time goes up as well. So still this industry, the QA industry on function testing or any other form of the pain points that we saw earlier, it is still a, a struggle. Uh, last but not, but not the least, this is funny because most most of the delay unknowingly is caused by the HR team because uh, let's say to, uh, you have to start a project in a month's time and you go to your HR and say, hey, I need a, a quality engineer person. The HR will come back and tell you, um, you know, about it's going to take three months time. Uh, that's the notice period triggered away. So there's a lot of uh, planning, replanning that happens just because of a recruitment thing. I'm pretty sure all of you are nodding your head to understand and, and empathize. Yes, this is exactly what I'm going to. So, uh, but there are ways and means to overcome some of this. I'm not saying I'm going to give you a 100% solution, but at least uh, the point is that I'm going to be giving you to minimize some of these uh, bottlenecks and then help you to overcome those. Okay. Um, I'll move to the next slide. Now, uh, this is a very, very important slide. Uh, as we said, this is going to um, this is going to remove some of the confusions that you all have. In fact, I also had uh, this in, in the last few years. I mean, uh, this this knowledge evolved evolved for me. So uh, these are the uh, four important terms you would have heard uh, repeatedly when you talk about any QA initiative, right? So let's let's understand um, each of this. Uh, so first is library. What is library? Basically, libraries uh, are set up code that is used uh, on top of any other program, uh, which can be plugged in and which can be reused, uh, uh, you know, uh, in any of the program. Basically, these are set up functions that are exposed in the library. Um, the terminology is very, very synonymous in those C, C++, or even, uh, yeah, I would say C, C++ world. Um, Java, they called it jar files, uh, which which can be considered. So basically, any reusable set of code were called libraries. Now, frameworks basically these are set of code or functions or nomenclatures or repositories uh, or reusable functions. Uh, so the frameworks can be used as a vanilla version. For example, today I may have a, a framework, uh, say a cookie book, uh, which I can right away plug it uh, in my uh, program, I can start using this framework. Also, these frameworks can be extended or uh, in other words, it can be enhanced or customized based on the organization's uh, requirements. So uh, frameworks uh, rule the world or in fact, even now ruling the world, um, you know, uh, you can have your own custom framework. So now if you look at it, every customer invariably has uh, uh, his or her own framework as well. Uh, Tools, so to speak, is basically an encapsulation of this framework uh, or libraries, so to speak. They are typically backed by the open source uh, uh, software group uh, or by product companies. Um, so you can right away, you don't have to you know, customize this tool. Most of the time, these tools are heavily um, uh, you know, developed with customers' pain points in mind. Nowadays, tools are just plug and play, where, like I said in the previous slide, for every stream or every capability that is a tool nowadays available. Now, platform, what I call amalgamation, it's a combination of all of the above. So I can have a platform uh, which supports multiple capabilities, which is uh, amalgamation of multiple tools. And more so, the platform can be customized for every user. 
this is what we're going to be uh, seeing and which is the need of the hour now which, uh, which i'll expand it in the next uh, few slides all right uh, now quickly moving on what is the need of the hour okay the need of the hour is a smart platform and why a smart platform as i told you there's a lot of delay from a qa standpoint uh, we we need a smart platform that uh, actually gets your automation skills in automated way it is a funny term what i call it here automated automation which minimizes the time spent on creating your actual scripts or code behind this uh, uh, test scripts uh, instead of the uh, test script creation you focus more on your results uh, that is what the platform should be supporting so uh, mind you mind the word that i'm using i'm using a smart platform uh, because uh, the platform has the ability to do more than one capability that's why i'm, I'm using this word smart platform rather than smart tool. so uh, we should have uh, an, an ability to do things uh, i mean the qa is driven by a lot of automation work uh, we, we'll see that uh, in the next slide um, this should reduce skill dependency which means uh, any person that uses this platform uh, in middle of what is or her uh, you know skill level the tool or the, I mean, sorry not the tool the platform should be able to produce uh, the the uh, generated automation scripts in a very seamless way every script that is generated uh, automated script that is generated or every capability that it performs um, should be same for every individual in middle of uh, the uh, user's uh, skill dependency it should give a lot of coverage um, because the platform should not be limited to one stream of uh, testing uh, it should be able to support automation performance security or even compatibility in some occasions which you can see in the next slide last but not the least we should be able to just embrace the existing platform and the platform should also give us a leeway to enhance um, additional uh, changes into the platform or add additional capability um, so that this becomes like a uh, you know completely a user driven uh, platform okay so um, now i want to quickly talk upon the forex uh, you know as i spoke to you in the last three slides the need of the hover why we want to uh, uh, why we have to think about a platform and what a platform should have one of the key design principle when uh, indium wanted to create a platform is basically we want to keep it very very simple because many times it will require it uh, for someone to learn selenium for doing automation for someone to learn jmeter to do performance or any vulnerability tool the learning curve is very very huge we want to minimize that so that was one of the uh, key principle that we had in mind of course we we want to establish a platform uh, which which uh, gives you an ability to do multiple capability the other key principle is uh, we we thought why don't why don't the functional testers uh, do automated way of functional tests why should they be limited to doing things manually so this uh, these are the key um, you know design principles that we had in mind or the requirements that we had in mind before we uh, finally invented this platform so to speak so i'll cover quickly the features of this platform what we call it low code automation we have introduced a, a smart uh, flexi grab into the browsers so these browsers would have now ability to capture the user interaction and it produces these interactions as a key value pair very very simple key value pair um, uh, and uh, with a pseudo code in the background it allows the manual tester to just play with the data changes uh, because it, it, it automatically identifies the screen elements for you once you record the script in the pseudo code all you have to do is uh, just change the value and then once you record the pseudo script it, it uh, basically you can re rerun this uh, with any data so assume as a manual tester um, usually that is the first thing that goes goes into the qa cycle i will generate these uh, you know reusable uh, you know flexi grab uh, uh, you know pseudo code with which any defect retest can happen just like swiftly now uh, we then want to do uh, you know automatic uh, script uh, script generation so through low code automation i will be able to export some of my scripts as automation scripts so you will have a jumpstart ability to get selenium scripts or protractor scripts 
or C sharp or Python, we now have written multiple converters with which I will be able to give you a jumpstart kit from your function testing uh, team itself. So uh, intelligent script maintenance, basically uh, we have brought in some intelligence into the platform where even if the application changes in terms of label being replaced or uh, um, you know, uh, text box uh, alignment changes from left to right, all of it is automatically detected and it will be highlighted in the sort of sort of code. All you have to do is regenerate or click out of field. Um, that will automatically heal the scripts. Um, so this, we feel uh, it gives you at least 40% effort saving because flakiness of the automation script is the real pain problem that the industry is going through. And uh, compatibility, again, we plugged in this ability to uh, run the same scripts that you have generated this far uh, against multiple browsers, multiple devices. Uh, uh, and then we can also plug this in in a CDCI uh, compatible uh, framework as well, which would mean in every single release, I'll be able to test the application across multiple browsers, multiple versions, and multiple devices. Um, now, the third one is uh, non functional testing. Now, uh, I would, I can review some of the automation stuff created uh, in the in the last uh, two uh, stages. I can reuse that to do my performance testing. Assessment. So, if you look at all of these four entities, one thing that runs common across is reusability, um, which means uh, whatever scripts that I generate out of my function testing team can be used for automation, can be used to do compatibility testing, can be used to do performance, vulnerability assessment. So, if you go back to last three slides, whatever pain points that I was talking about, all of it is addressed. Everything is now, uh, you know, potentially is automated with the minimal hands to keyboard. Uh, you know, a lot of reusability, so skill skill dependency is drastically cut down. Um, that is the whole aim of this platform. Last but not the least, uh, we wanted to live without any dependency on the test data, so we created our own native test data generator. This comes with multiple schema uh, in place, which means uh, at a click of a button, I can generate a million SSN number, valid SSN number, so to speak. I can generate uh, US or UK addresses. There is a prototype already built into it. Uh, so, with this note, I want to leave you with the thought that this platform, um, you know, what we strive to do, as I said, is to minimize the skill dependency, uh, minimize all the issues that I spoke about. Uh, and this platform, as we speak, stands in the 1.0 version. Um, we are working very, very uh, closely uh, internally and with the customers as well to implement some of the feedbacks that we've been getting. So, um, do check uh, with, uh, with us. Uh, uh, through our website, um, we'll see more and more updates coming across. Um, lastly, uh, if you want for the demo of this uh, platform, there's a link that is displayed here. And uh, there is also a Indian YouTube uh, channel. I would recommend to go take a look at uh, one of the Forex video that we have recently published. That will give you a quick bird's eye view of what this platform is all about. I'm just checking the time here. I think I'm just on time. Um, so I will now open my chat window to see if we have any questions. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, interesting question. Uh, so the question, a little the question for you, it says, how do you compare RPA with this platform? Brilliant question. Uh, see, the purpose of RPA is meant to automate a repetitive task. Uh, example, invoice processing or any HR workflow, they are not meant to be used as uh, an automation tool. But a uh, good question, I think this question is more relevant uh, in the last few months, I would say, because uh, in the recent days, uh, RPA is evolving as a test automation tool. Um, I would advise all of you to go and check UAPath test suit offering. Um, in fact, uh, Indium is one of the pioneer, uh, we are partnered with UAPath as well. Uh, Indium is one of the pioneer where we attempted to do UA path based automation uh, in the last uh, six months or so. Uh, in fact, we uh, we gave this uh, information to the UA path the representative and tell him because there was one unique customer problem that we had. This customer um, has hosted most of this application on Citrix uh, and very, very legacy based application. So we tried with all the automation tool like plan or test complete, none of it was able to do full automation. And hence, we went uh, with UiPath-based license, and surprisingly, UiPath worked like a breeze. 
um, I think that probably UiPath would have heard this to he and probably they started creating this test suit. But it's a it's a good question. Okay, uh, I think the next question, yes, that is another good question. It says, how do you see uh, open source software help in driving some of these QA challenges? Wow. Okay, uh, this has to be a detailed explanation to bear with me. I think uh, first is a great question. Um, see, open source market was a closed loop uh, market in the past. If you, if you remember, some of the old timers could remember. Uh, we used to have a few companies like Apache, Red Hat. Uh, only those were the few few companies uh, you know, exposing the open source uh, you know, reusable libraries or code to us. Uh, but in the recent advent of GitHub, uh, you know, we started getting so many exposures to other contributors. Uh, many many individuals are contributing to it. Um, it's actually expanded the horizon big time. Big players like Google, Facebook, Netflix, Microsoft, they all have contributed. Um, you know, thousand, thousand millions of uh, code into uh, you know open source libraries, and the list grows every day. Uh, that uh, I would say every hour. Now, uh, in order to be successful in this unsuccessful QA, we put it that way, we need a dedicated uh, R&D team inside every QA organization that focuses on improving the capability uh, by building frameworks or platforms, um, or by reusing those uh, open source libraries. Uh, see, nowadays everything is docked. So it's a great way to build a plug and play platform. I think uh, I'll stop here. Um, I think I'm, I'm done with this presentation. So as I said, I'll leave you with a thought of what a platform is and why a smart platform is uh, required. And do check with this link that I'm displaying in the current window uh, where uh, you can uh, you can uh, come back to this link. Uh, we will take requests to um, you know uh, to, to give you guys a demo. Uh, we are setting up this demo where we're going to demo the platform completely for you. That will be a completely action-packed demo where you can see the Cypress platform live in action. You can ask uh, questions as well. And uh, there is also a YouTube channel, as I said. You can type uh, Indian uh, software in the YouTube. Uh, you can take you to the you, for its introduction video, uh, I'm pretty sure you will like it. So with that note, uh, the, uh, we, we are, we are uh, almost to the end of this webinar. Uh, thanks for attending. I hope uh, this webinar uh, gave you some perspective of what we need to be doing, uh, what all uh, you know activities we need to plan. And uh, you can also think about how uh, Indium can help you in some of these challenges. Do pass on this uh, information about this webinar and our platform to some of your colleagues uh, um, in your uh, uh, network world. Um, and then uh, do let us know how we can be of any help to you. With that note, uh, thanks again, once again. Good morning or good evening. Uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, see you in the next webinar. Thank you.